It is baptism that brings us into God's family and makes us his beloved sons and daughters. For the first thousand plus years of Christianity's existence, that baptism meant simply being a member of the Christian church, the Catholic church. And it is that baptism that, first and foremost, makes an individual a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus went to speak with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus and he were discussing things, Jesus said, unless you were born of water and the Spirit, you cannot have eternal life. And over the centuries, we've come to understand that that act of pouring water and invoking the name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, does something profound. It changes the soul of the recipient. It marks that individual irrevocably, regardless of what paths the individual might follow, regardless how far away he or she might go from God, their soul is always marked with the mark of Jesus Christ given through baptism. As we know throughout history as well, beginning in 1054 with the great schism between the East and the West, there have been sad divisions among the Christian peoples. And then after the, the Protestant Reformation, those divisions became even more numerous. But there is no denying the reality that Jesus came into the world to preach the truth and to leave behind his living presence in the form of the church. And his prayer that we've been hearing during the weekday cycle from the 17th chapter of John's Gospel is very clear that his intention, his desire, was that his bride, the church, would always be one. And it's only through our human failings, our weaknesses, our prejudices, that those divisions have occurred throughout the centuries. Sometimes for very valid theological reasons, because we always have to be faithful to that which was handed on. But the fact that you all are here this evening to make your profession and to be received fully into uh, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is a great testament to the power of God's grace. You come for different reasons. Some of you have come because of your own study, your own desire. Others have been exposed to the church because of a spouse or another family member. Whatever the reason, the fact is that you are here this evening and you are making a very public statement. It's a public statement before those gathered, so a public statement before this portion of the Church Universal, but more importantly, it's a public statement that you are making before God. And you are saying that your intention from this day forward is to live the fullness of the faith in the Church that the Lord established for the salvation of the world. The fullness of the sacraments that Jesus has given us and entrusted to the church is for that. It's to give us life, to give us strength, and to help us deal with the world in which we live. And this evening you will profess the faith, the common faith of the Christian church, the Nicene Creed, 
And then you will add your assent to that creed. And following that, you will receive the sacrament of confirmation, along with some of our other brothers and sisters who, uh, for whatever reason, had not yet received that last sacrament of initiation. What does confirmation do? Confirmation strengthens the reality, the presence of the Holy Spirit that was there at baptism, and it completes that so that you can be truly faithful witnesses. Jesus told the apostles before he ascended, you will be my witnesses to all the ends of the earth. And in the end, that's what confirmation is called to do, to strengthen you and to help you be a faithful witness. Last week, the bishop asked me to preside and to celebrate confirmation for about half of of our young people in the parish, which I was very happy to do. And I used the example of something that Pope Francis had done just a couple of weeks ago. And he added 21 names to the Roman Martyrology. The Martyrology is that book that lists those holy souls who have given witness to Christ by their lives. And he added 21 names, 21 Coptic Christians, to that role. And the Coptics are uh, not uh, fully in union with the Catholic Church. They have valid sacraments, but the fact that the Holy Father did that is a testimony to the fact that we need faithful witnesses in all areas of life and in all areas of Christian life. But these 21 were construction workers in Libya, and when ISIS came in, they were taken captive and they were given an option. They said, you deny your Christianity, become Muslim, and you're fine. If you fail to do that, though, there will be consequences. They all to a man refused to deny Christ. And they were marched out on the beach and decapitated. That's witness. That's bravery and that's strength. Only 20 were actually Coptic Christians. The 21st was working with them. And when the captors came to him, he said, he said, I'm not a Coptic Christian, but their God is mine and he died with them. We're past a point in the church of needing folks who are only half-hearted in their following of Christ. In the book of Revelation, the Lord says, I will spew out from my mouth those who are lukewarm. We don't need lukewarm Christians. We don't need lukewarm Catholics. We need people who are willing to stand up and to be counted for Christ. We are in a world that more and more is hostile to the gospel message. We certainly, thankfully, are not facing the persecution of those in Libya and some of the other parts of the world. But nonetheless, we seem to tolerate all too often the denigration of our faith and very few people stand up and do anything about it. Most recently, if you pay attention to the news, the, you know, the L.A. Dodgers have invited the, a particular religious hate group uh, to be honored at one of their games, whose specific reason for existing is to ridicule the Christian faith, and specifically the Catholic faith. The Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, they call themselves. And we see that and we see other examples. And we have to realize that, you know, Christianity is not a faith that is to make us comfortable. It's not a faith that's to make life easy. Jesus didn't promise that our faith would make life easy. He said, take up your cross and follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the decision we have to make is, do I want to be forever with the Father in heaven? And if so, then this is the way. 
and this way involves the cross. And the only way to get there is through the cross. And so the fact that you are here this evening, the fact that you are either embracing the fullness of the faith or completing your Christian initiation is a testimony to the fact that you want to live the Christ life, that you want to live in a manner in which you show forth the fact that you belong to Christ, that your souls have been marked by his spirit, and that you intend to live each day in union with him for the glory of God and for the building up of his kingdom. And if that's not the case, feel free to go home. It's an honor for a pastor and any priest to celebrate these sacraments because it's a reminder to us of what we gave our lives for. Sacraments aren't magic. They are powerful, but they are not magic. We have to live the grace that we're given in them. We have to have the intention of opening our hearts and our minds to Christ. We have to intend to live in union with him. And we do that imperfectly because all of us are sinners. And thanks be to God, the Lord knew that and so gave the apostles the power to forgive sins. And they've handed that down through the church so that all of us can benefit from his divine mercy. But our intention always has to be to live in union with him, to live a sacramental life that is a shining witness in the darkness to show forth the power, the love, the mercy of Christ, to show forth that which is good and true and beautiful, which the world sadly tries to distort, pervert, and corrupt. And so when we profess the faith in just a moment, I ask you to listen to the words, to listen to the words carefully, and to understand what it is that we do each time we profess it. And that message is for all of us who are here in the church. All too often we allow what we do at Mass on a weekly basis to simply become a habit. We say it without thinking about it. And that should never happen. Because the words that we say when we profess the creed are words that our brothers and sisters by the thousands have died for over the course of centuries. And yet, so often and so many take that casually. We can't afford to do that anymore. If we say it, we need to mean it, and we need to live it. So I would invite everyone to stand. And for those of you coming into the full communion of the church, you are here of your own free will, and you've asked to be received into the full communion of the Catholic Church. You've made this decision after careful thought, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so I invite you, in the presence of this community, of our parish, to profess the Catholic faith. In this faith, you will become one with us for the first time at the Eucharistic table of the Lord Jesus, which is the sign of the church's unity. And at the end of the creed, we'll ask these brothers and sisters of ours to add their personal assent to the creed, and then we will celebrate uh, their act of reception and the sacrament of confirmation. And so we pray together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. 
He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.